narrating um, Kritua's um, untimely uh, death. So uh, more about that will follow and um, without delaying um, this program any further, I'm going to introduce you to Prof Associate Professor Christopher Omar, who is Deputy Dean Research uh, for the Faculty of Humanities. So oh, we're very pleased that we um, have Professor Omar with us to be doing this um, important uh, launch um, on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities for us at the San and Koi Center. And Professor Omar is also um, a member of staff of the Center for African Studies, in fact, in African Studies, and also in English Literature. So a well-known figure in literature, and we very honored and pleased to have you, Professor Omar. I now hand over to you to officially open this event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Junpa Machison. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, to launch or to open what I consider one of the most important um, uh, research initiatives at the University of Cape Town and in the Faculty of Humanities. Um, I am excited, honestly, and June and I have had a couple of conversations uh, in the past few weeks uh, and even before some informal back channel conversations. And I'm very excited to be here uh, and to welcome all of you uh, who managed to join us from different parts of the world. Um, and this is a very important project for the faculty uh, on behalf of the Dean of Humanities, Associate Professor Shosa Kesi, uh, again, um, sending her apologies for the ability to get here today, but also just uh, emphasizing how important it is that we are here today. Uh, in light, of course, of uh, the history of the University of Cape Town, thinking about uh, you know, knowledge production from the Global South and specifically from the Cape, uh, this research initiative is absolutely at the heart uh, of why uh, we think that the Faculty of, Mani of Humanities should be going in this kind of direction. So my role here is to uh, welcome you and introduce uh, our inaugural speaker today, uh, uh, Dr. Yvette Abrams, and I'm going to proceed to do that, after which I will hand um, over to her and um, uh, we can begin. So. Let me just uh, give you a quick biography of uh, Dr. Yvette Abrams. Uh, Dr. Yvette Abrams holds a PhD in economic history from the University of Cape Town. She has consulted for government and various NGOs on issues related to gender, equality in policy and practice, while publishing widely, both locally and internationally on gender equality, queer theory, climate change, as well as the history of First Nations, um, First Nations South Africans. She served as commissioner for gender equality, um, uh, where she headed the, their program on poverty, energy, and climate change. She subsequently worked as advisor to Project 90 by 2030, an NGO which focuses on food security, energy, um, uh, food security, energy, and climate change. She subsequently worked as advisor, my apologies, uh, food security, energy, and promoting renewable energy and energy efficiency and entrepreneurship in the context of climate change. Thank you. My apologies. She served as commissioner on the, on the University of Cape Town's Institutional Reconciliation and Truth Commission and currently applies her indigenous knowledge in making organic carbon neutral soaps and body products on a small holding east of Cape Town. Uh, once again, it's a pleasure to have all of you here, and it's a pleasure to meet and, and, and be able to listen to you, Dr. Yvette Abrams. I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you, June. Thank you all. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Omar, um, and, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the Sun and Koi unit for inviting me to moderate the session. It, it is an utter honor to, to moderate the inaugural Kratoa lecture. Um, it, I'm, I'm very moved because um, for, for, for many years, people have tried to create as the center of knowledge for Khoisan research on the Khoisan. And um, we, we tried once before at the Institute of Historical Research, where both you and myself have roots. Uh, and, and, and that unfortunately didn't last, it lasted for a few years. 
So I was delighted to see new beginnings at the Center for African Studies. Um, and, and, and I'm certainly very excited to see as, as work comes out of there. Um, so without further ado to, to move into the session, I will start by welcoming Tony Stewart, who is going to read us a poem. Tony is an <coughs> internationally known and published South African scholar, artist and performer, born in Cape Town. She currently lives in Kenya. Um, of her ground, uh, we have many ground babies making works, including Krakoa, Siva's Sweet, a Cape Town jazz poem in key movement. So welcome, Tony. The floor is yours. Thank you, Yvette. Um, and thank you, everyone, for this event and for this honoring. Um, I'm going to share uh, these poems as a way of opening the space, as a way of honoring our ancestors. And my intention with sharing these poems is to call in the water, to call in the land, to call in the and to call in our ancestors to be in circle with us this afternoon. We understand that whenever we come together to remember to work in the archives, we are working with spirits. And so we come with the intention to honor those spirits and to ask for permission to do this work and to speak. And when we close today, we do so remembering that we lay those spirits back to rest and we honor them and we offer gratitude. And so I open the circle with poems from Krito Eva Sweet, the Cape Jazz poem in three movements. For the first mother, a litany. O oh, mother of two skins, O oh, mother of betrothed and betrayal, O oh, of two sins, O oh, mother of ash and animal, O oh, mother praying to two gods, you pray to kneeling in church. Who did you pray to kneeling at the camp? O oh, mother of lust and love, O oh, mother bent by men's dreams, O oh, mother of undiagnosed despair, O oh, praying to two gods, did you remember to pray for us? O oh, mother disowned by people who birthed you, O oh, mother unloved, O oh, mother disowned by the people who raised you, O oh, mother of brokenness, O oh, mother disowned by the people you birthed, O oh, mother forgotten. O oh, mother against your skin, compassion never brushed. O oh, mother, O oh, mother, O oh, mother praying to two gods. Did you remember to pray for yourself? O oh, mother of our lost wildness, O oh, mother keeper of our buried voices, unearth them for us. O oh, mother of our smoldering rage, set fire to us. O oh, mother of our forgotten wounds, weep with us. The woman teaches herself how to give birth. They are prayers only women know. Prayers we sing into the silences. Prayers we sing into our wombs. Prayers we sing over a newborn soft head. Prayers we sing over our wounds. Prayers we sing into a newborn's mouth to teach her how to breathe. Prayers we sing into a young girl's lungs when time comes for her to grieve. Yes, these are prayers only women know, reaped from the moon at first bleed. Prayers never whispered, prayers only sung and yet sown quiet as our need. Prayers learned by through each loss, after loss, after loss. Prayers the world wrote on and against us and against us. And with these prayers that only women know. We offer breath loud enough to pull a child into life. Prayer stronger than the cord, prayer sharper than a knife. And with her first cry, we witness her first prayer sung back into the womb she has left to learn breath and death, to learn breath and death. 
Robben Island. One. Deserted. Even the southeaster stays away now. But her curves rove and return to shore. Look how she conspires with moon to soften the appearance of her folds. No one speaks of her barrenness, her vast, unending nothingness, stealing men away to their dreams, luring them further and further until she seduces them across her hips, always trying to make herself fertile. Give me a fluid coaxing and I will crash against his stone body, lure him back into this once warm love. When his back is turned in sleep, I will sing a strangle of notes against the granite of his limbs, lapping, lapping, crashing and receding and crashing, lapping until he is shaped only by my will. But no, the hips of her horizon have all sway. Robin Island, too becoming liquid. Slow, slink of skin, stretch of tongue, soft and reachable swath of skin, stretch of tongue, tongue and reachable swaths of skin, such sun, such sun against skin, thin and tongue fat and thick against skin, sending against skin, sending tongue, stretching slow, sliding soft on silent swaths of skin and mouth, suckling mouth, suckling secret nipples. Lust is the only room in the body to which men entrust their honesty. Slow, slink of skin, tongue soft, against skin sinning, tongue fat, against skin, tongue stretching, slow, silent swords, mouths, suckling, nipples. There are no homes to be found in the rooms made by men's arms and legs. Slow stretch of skin. Tonguing unreachable. Such sin. Against skin sinning. Sliding soft. Mouths. Suckling. Knuckles. The moon spits in my face, laughs at my desire to become but like her. Robin Island 3, Foresight. They say I am the reason the wind no longer blows. The Kohina say I am the reason the season stands still. The Dutch say I am the reason the ships stand still. Now I am EFI in my garden deserted. Now I am Kratua wrapped in a carros of no warmth. Only Etsyep knows what is to come. My children will turn the silence of their backs to me. The Clerk, Kruger, Smuts will all deny the sweetness of my name in their bed. We offer gratitude to our ancestors. We offer gratitude to the land. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. That that was truly moving. Um, I'm I'm not sure if it's appropriate to to applaud on Zoom or not, but but yeah, no, that that was very really lovely. Thank you so much. So so my next task is to introduce the speaker for today, um, Colleen Zaiman. She is a direct descendant of Kratoa through the line of her daughter. Kutunella and is part of the Khoring Haikona Khoikhoin Traditional Indigenous Council. Um, Karin's research and curatorial activities have been profoundly shaped by her ancestral connections to Kratoa as she pursues her work from this embodied position. Um, she labors to find ways of doing justice to the complexity of the inheritance by working towards unlearning and undoing coloniality. 
Um, so, Corinne, very welcome. We look forward to hearing you. Right, Jeff. Um, thank you very much, Yvette, um, and also Tony for um, inaugurating the space in such a wonderful way. Um, also, would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Dr. June Van Hutchinson, Torek Jenkins, and the Queensland Unit um, at the, the Centre for African Studies. I'm honoured and humbled by your generous invitation to speak at this auspicious event. It is so wonderful that you have established this important centre. And I look forward with eager anticipation to the work that you will produce and your continuing um, stimulation of vital knowledge. Also, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that it's a, a, a moment of intense um, pressure and, and um, tragedy for many South Africans. I want to share my screen with you. Can you please give me an indication if you can see my shared screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dear members of the audience, please join me in a flight of fancy. Imagine that everyday events are occurring in front of us as though we were watching a play unfolding on stage. Abruptly, the scene becomes so dramatic, so overwhelming, that it seems that the world at large, instead of happening at a remove from the audience or us, it faces and addresses us directly. It sticks out a finger and pokes our shoulders. What will you make of this? Some events break the fourth wall of history. Of course, at this moment, we are primed to grasp the sense of being addressed directly by the world, living as we are through a global pandemic and a world in crisis, reeling from uncertainty and tragedy. Taking my cue from the wounding happening to us right now, I want to bookend this lecture with two other events that pierce the veil separating audience from action and that I hold to be collapsing the distance between us and people from the past. It would be hubris to employ these disasters um, as bookends on a lecture to, on Couture in a manner that suggests that they can be conscripted as actors in the theater of humanity rather than as its authors and directors. But that's not what I intend to do. Instead, I refer to these events because they exceed established rubrics of sense. They defy conventional comprehension and thereby frame us. I want to use our time together to ask what it is that we can learn from the ruptures and disruptions they produced. The first event I want to consider is the most recent. The globally dispersed community connected to the University of Cape Town awoke on 18 April this year to scattered reports of a fire on Murikwahu, Table Mountain. At first we heard that the restaurant at Rose Memorial suffered major damage from an exploding gas bottle. Some of us may have thought wryly, that old chestnut, Rose, is at it again. But the wind shifted and fanned flames towards UCT's upper campus. Students were evacuated and buildings cleared. Before long, a frightful image lighted up computer screens and mobile phones around the world. The Jagger Reading Room is on fire. Swiftly, scholars, activists and artists began enumerating what was at risk as the flames tore through the building. The university's special collection, comprising photographic collections, archival documents and out-of-print books, all faced unbearable peril. This is a, an image of the Jagger Reading Room before the fire. Several people reminded us that the priceless trove of time histories, the Blake and Lloyd archive, was lodged in a basement in the library. Was the material digitized, many people asked. But archival documents are more than text, more than what can re be reproduced purely, intangibly or immaterially. After waiting breathlessly for the salvage operation to start, we received reports of what was lost Blake and Lloyd were safe, thankfully, but around 70,000 books, 3,500 DVDs featuring historical film and government documents from Africa were destroyed. That is the reading room after the fire. The African Studies Collection held many treasures from the African continent, including resources for gender studies, media studies, HIV AIDS research, and African language studies. A comprehensive list of what is, was ruined is still being collated. 
Shock and sadness in the wake of the fire were soon followed by realizations that as it destroyed, the fire in many ways also revealed and made sensible some dynamics of archive. Images taken by volunteers in the salvage operation circulated on social media. Some of the damaged but partially legible material brought into view this way had not been consulted for years. The fire also made visible the precarity of archives, their fragility in the face of disasters such as the fire. It was not only the fire that damaged the material in the special collection. Destruction was also inevitably caused by water that quenched the fire, which dissolved emulsion on the photograph and glued pages of books together while ungluing them from their spines. But other more intangible things also became visible. Many commentators pointed out the irony inherent in the collective outcry over this loss, while every summer fire, fires wreak havoc in informal settlements across the Western Cape, attracting far less attention, concern, or action. We further came to understand that what was lost was not only a connection with the past, but also one to the future. It was future work on lost material was now fundamentally affected. Potential scholarship and archival engagement rendered forever unrealized. In the collective mourning of the material destroyed by the fire, what was it that we feared was lost? When these fires raged, it was certainly not history that was in peril, that was in peril but rather the site that we designated to hold the deposits of our past. As the fire moved us to collective mourning, I wondered whether we were also not, we were not also forgetting the ways in which archives have failed us. When I think of Couture, it is often the failure of archives that come to mind. After decades of being neglected by historians, her story has, since the 1990s, been pressed into service to stand for the multitudes of those whose stories never made it into the archive, those whose worlds were erased and made past by colonialism. As her popularity as historical figure rose, many scholars, writers, and artists, including me, flocked to the preeminent source on her life, namely the VOC diaries of Van Riebeek and his successors. But looking for Couture on these pages is a frustrating and in some ways a future at every turn, one is reminded of how it's fragmented and unilluminating these reports of her life are. In the VST sources, we find only glimpses of Couture. Details that allow glassing a sector, a sector, such as the condition of colonial archives. Let us not forget power in it, not only in historical narration, but in the very way that the sources on which the narrations are founded have been convened. As Michel or Rolf Trujillo reminds us in his volume, Silencing the Past, such power is exercised through various acts of unintentional or intentional silencing. And he states, <laughs> Since this is a lecture about Couture, it follows that we should discuss who she was, but I always resist telling her story. I'm deeply uncomfortable with rehearsing the narrative of her life on the basis of information as gleaned from colonial archives. So what can we say? We can say, Couture was a woman who was part of the Korangai Kona. We can say, Couture is an almost exact contemporary of Isaac Newton. We can say, Couture found herself in the Van Riebeek household at around 10 or 11. Later, she became an, became an indispensable translator between various Goya groups and the Dutch. She married Peter van, van Meerhof. She had at least three children. She lived at Van Meerhof on Robben Island. After the death of her husband in Madagascar, she was imprisoned there and she died there. We can say, Couture loved her uncle, Ultramatu. They both could speak many languages including Portuguese and Dutch. These are but slivers of a narrative, and when we rehearse her story, the fragmentary nature of the archival accounts should inform not only the content, but also the manner of our narration. However, even with all the silences and absences in the archives related to Couture, she nevertheless has partial visibility, 
much more than most Khoi people in the history of this country. Due to the privilege of her partial visibility, Kritoa teaches us that partial archival presence often blinds us to absence. We can discern this blindness in the ways in which Kritoa's story has been publicly rehearsed. For example, the controversial film Kritoa of 2017, which was directed by Roberta Durant, written by Kay Ann Williams and Margaret Goldsmith, fundamentally relies on telling Kritoa's story as found in the VOC journals, with some questionable sentiment added. Public dissatisfaction with the film is likely occasioned by the fact that while, they tried, while the film tried to present a sympathetic picture of Kritoa, it failed to, failed to exceed the colonial archives. That is, the film tried to stay true to most, for the most part to the colonial source material, but did not acknowledge the absences inherent therein and did not take sufficient account of the desires of the social imagination into which it attempted to insert its narrative. Another example of the way in which Kritua's partial visibility blinds us to the absences in the archival material pertaining to her is this image you can see on the left, top left. If one does a search today on Wikipedia or even the magnificent South African History Online website, this is the image that accompanies entries on Kritua. It was first published, as far as I can ascertain, in P. W. Laidler's Growth in Government in Cape Town in 1939, where it appears a poor reproduction in black and white, unattributed and simply captioned EFR. Despite the provenance not being disclosed in Laidler's text, it has been used similarly unqualified in countless forms and has become the image associated with Kritua. It, is mo it most likely gained foothold through its appearance on the cover of Trudy Bloom's novella, Kritua Iefa, the woman from Robben Island. The ubiquity of this image and the ease with which it has been assimilated as a portrait for her obscures the fact that there, in fact, exists no image of Kritua. Apart from blinding us to absence, Kritoa's partial visibility in the archives has meant that pressure is continuously exerted on her story to stand in for all those who've been left out of the archive. The pressure on slivers of archival informa information on Kritoa to, 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 to tell stories far beyond than what they contain should therefore come as no surprise. In South Africa, among other post colonies, the absence of the majority of the population from the archives is constitutive of a present crisis. The absence is in the first instance evidence of the oppressive effects of colonialism, while in the second instance it precludes people from establish, establishing a history of their own outside of the colonial narrative. In the face of absence caused by colonial oppression, the post-colony embarks on a series of endeavors to populate the archive post facto. As these activities are driven by a desire to articulate and manifest identity separate from or in rebellion against colonial structure, Material that exceeds conventional archival holdings is sought. The presence of ancestors is called for, but the ancestors are excluded from the official archives. Contemporary emotional investment in Kritua's story is the result of the failure of colonial archives to answer the needs of post-apartheid of, of post South Africa. Due to the widely acknowledged biases and spaceness, colonial archives are insufficient as custodians of the past and in some ways can even be understood to prevent a meaningful connection to it. Being denied custodianship of your own past can and has been experienced as trauma. Margaret Iverson defines the traumatic as, quote, an experience that has failed to achieve representation, but on which nonetheless one whole existence depends, end quote. It is in this vein that the absences in the archive can be understood as traumatic. They do not and cannot have representation, but they nevertheless shape the lives we live. Although a general condition of archives, the melancholy and desire for representation become especially pronounced in times and spaces where there is a need, as it were, to resurrect the dead. When, when there is an urgent need to reclaim identity and belonging in a country of the multitudinous dispossessed, absences in the archive become intolerable. In the conventional sense of archive, there is no robust one to counter the colonial ones. Counter-colonial identity cannot therefore be founded alone on an appeal to archives. The inherent limitations of archives to help populate pre-colonial historiography is not their only failure. They also pose a formidable challenge to what we may consider knowledge production. <clears throat> 
As Van Harris contends, if archives are seen to be the repositories of memory, their slightness presents a problem. Absence troubles the generative function of archives. Inasmuch as archives are places where material is both stored and ordered, they are also the sources that are repeatedly returned to in order to gain knowledge of the past. In the context of post-colonial and decolonial scholarship, absence of archival presence is profoundly frustrating. When archives not merely seem to exclude a person or people, but to be actively against them by preventing them from establishing a continuum with their ancestors, hindering their access to the knowledge relegated by colonial re regimes, the only recourse may be found in the critiques of archival formation. But even after such important and valuable arguments have been digested, we are still left with the absences that the formation of colonial archives have set in place. What then are we to do with this loss, these abs absences? I'm going to stop sharing for a short for a while. If archives fail us due to the extent of absence, we need to think differently about what it is to have custodianship of the past. Moreover, when archives burn, we should not only focus on what is lost, but turn our gaze to what is located elsewhere. But how do we find this elsewhere? In my own work on Kotoa, I've read the archives searching for what I term imprints of absence. I found these imprints in close readings of the language employed in the journals where Kutua is often quoted in direct speech, or in places where the author expresses frustration when Kutua did not behave the Dutch settlers had wanted her to. In other words, when she attempted to assert her agency. In these sections, I have in my mind the very palpable sensation of running my fingers over the grain of the documents and feeling the impressions therein. I use the term imprint because an imprint is something that was made by a presence that is now absent. It reminds us of the fact that there was a presence whose fullness we cannot fully apprehend now. Whereas the word silences communicates that something isn't there, it does not necessarily move one to think of the extent of absence. A methodology that positions certain silences in archives as imprints of absence follow, um, sorry, follow the vast extent of absence that envelops archives and further is that the substance of absence, uh, the substance of that absence keep eluding our grasp. Identifying imprints of absence within archives goes some distance towards positioning them as always been in relation to absence. The interplay between presence and absence in the archives pertaining to Kutua, made manifest via a method of reading the imprints of absence, leads me to consider the vastness of absence, the absence of presence that made the impression on the archive more directly. In short, the imprints of absence have, has directed my gaze towards unrecoverable, obs um, unrecoverable absence, or what I have called the an archive. And yeah, I wish to um, acknowledge the Archive and Public Culture at UCT and also under Carolyn Hamilton for helping me develop the notion of the an archive. I conceive the an archive as a means to articulate a connection to the past that issues reliance on slivers of archival material as evidence to be employed towards historical narration. The an archive is focused on what is absent from archives, that which cannot by definition be contained by archival documents, such as the full sensorial experience of lived life, its non-linear temporality, unrealized potentials, and immaterial networks of intersubjectivity. An anarchival engagement with archives is one that positions archival absence not as incidental, a regrettable fuzziness occasioned by conditions of archival formation. No. Instead, the anarchive seeks to position as central the vastness of that which archives simply cannot contain. As a result, the anarchive locates custodianship of the past not in, not in archives, but in various other intangible forms. Seeking to loosen the ossifying grip archival material has habitually held on historical narration, I want to make visible the extent of absence in archive in, in my work and my thinking, particularly those fashioned along imperatives of colonial epistemology and in its service. The consequence of the centralization of absence is that archives are shown to be proportionately trivial. Their capacity to control what can be known and narrated about the past is rendered absurd. Even so, the an archive does not suggest that archives have no value. Rather, it locates that value in the imprints of absence that they hold, the ways in which they can help bring into view what is not there. As I followed the unfolding events of the fire, 
feeling the finger of the world prodding my shoulder, my hope was that the An Archive might guide us to a history from the ashes. For me, what was in peril, as I said, was not history, but the imprints of absence, the capacity of engagement with those archives to reveal what they are missing, and, could, and more importantly, to apprehend the multitudes of other ways in which the past is living with us, and the forms of custodianship that keeps it. Here, I'm directed by the work of various scholars, artists, and writers, such as, such as you, June, um, and other members of the Center for African Studies. You have advocated for other ways of knowing, knowing on the wind, I think you have, you, you've called it in, in various places. Knowing that is not intent on fixing the past, not concerned with clear essential categories, but a knowing that fully embraces the vitality and changeability of the past. Another custodian of the past addressed us earlier, Tony Stewart, through her words, her being, her voice, embodies a poetic custodianship, one that recognizes the weight of responsibility that attends her role. I started this lecture with reference to the fire that gutted the Jagger Library reading room. And I have today suggested that the fire should not simply lead us to improve the technologies of preservation, but rather that we should seize the opportunity to pause and radically rethink how we conceive custodianship of the past. Many other meaningful and restorative ways in which to connect to the past exist, but conventional Western scholarship has deemed these insufficient as sources, while at the same time condemning us to the dead ends of colonial archives. It is time to shake off these shackles. Our moment of loss is a moment of opportunity for reclaiming modes of knowing, embodied, co-designed, spiritual, spiritual, intuitive, imaginative, and ways of knowing intent on connecting us with each other. I find my own way of imagining what other embodied ways of knowing may look like or feel like by making reference to a second event that breaks the fourth wall of history. It is a storm. By the time of her death, Kritua was widowed. Her children had been taken from her and she had fallen into disrepute at the colony. Despite her demeaned stature at this time, Kritua's death was not only reported, but also extensively recorded in a journal entry. As Carlos Kuman has remarked on the emotional tone of this entry, quote, on Sunday, 29 July 1674, the journal, in an especially strikingly long passage, described how the wind, which had been raging for two days, suddenly abated, struck dumb and banished from the world, and the furious waves of the sea changed into tranquility, end quote. The passage to which Kuman refers marks Kritua's final appearance in the journals, quote, from the journals. This day departed this life, Yefa, long ago taken from the African brood in attended childhood by the Honorable Van Ribiak, and educated in his house, as well as brought to the knowledge of the Christian faith and being thus transformed almost into a Netherland woman, end quote. The entry continues in disparaging tones, which I will not repeat in this forum, but it makes for thoroughly upsetting reading. As Kuman points out, the conjunction of the storm and Kritua's death in this entry might strike the contemporary reader as poetic, if read as such, and could, it, could inspire an affective response. It never fails to move me. The writing itself is also particularly emotive and brings into consciousness an emotion the author, author presumably felt while, whilst writing the entry. We cannot see Kutua accurately through his words, but we can intimate, intimate the weightiness of her presence in the early Cape colony. Moreover, the author employs a phrase in the entry, which quote, the fire of her sensuality, end quote. This phrase conveys an altogether palpable sense of a living human being, embodied and present, even if we, as we must, distrust the tone of his description. We are tantalized by the force of her being that elicited such an emotional response. The report of Kritua's death is a stirring example of how, through the substance, though the, sorry, the report of her death is a stilling example of how, though the substance of Kritua as person is absent from the writing, we are reminded that we do not know enough about her to reconstruct her presentness. We can only follow Kritua into the An Archive, into a comprehensive contemplation of absence. The storm that attended the death of Kritua blows into my imagination whenever I think of her, but it does not end there. Today I'm speaking to you from the Netherlands, the land from which Jan van Riebeek and Zacharias Wagenaar set sail for the Cape of Good Hope. 
Having spent some time in the last year engaging with scholars, artists, and museum workers here, I can testify that in certain sectors at least, a great deal of intellectual and emotional energy is being expended on thinking about the implicatedness of the Dutch in slavery and colonialism. But unlike South Africans, the Dutch generally lack an embodied experience with the legacies of colonialism. It is very hard for many people here to appreciate fully what the after effects and after lives of colonialism are because they do not live it daily. And I'm going to share my screen again. Can you see that? Is that good, Jim? Yes, yes, good. Okay, and there we go. Perhaps though, the sites of Utrecht and Cape Town are not as disconnected as Dutch public consciousness would have it. I recently learned of a devastating storm that blew, that blew through the Netherlands on 1 August 1674 and caused a great deal of damage in Utrecht in particular. I cannot ignore this correlation. Three days after the storm that imprinted on the VOC archives, intense winds accompanied by thunder, lightning and hail pulled trees from their roots, sunk nine boats and toppled the city's landmark, the Tower of the Donkirk. Nothing connects these two storms but me. My embodied presence in Utrecht today, I see in my mind's eye the turbulent waters around Table Mountain and feel the strength of the wind tugging at my limbs while the rain drenches my hair. I conjure a vision of Kutua's spirit raging over the Cape as it leaves her body, howling at her oppressors. But since learning about the Dutch storm, in my imagination, Kutua's storm spirit then makes its way to Utrecht, devastating the town by a sudden unexpected force. These two storms are triangulated by me in my present and I make them one. Recognizing other forms of custodianship of the past requires us not only to give full credit to such subjective triangulation, but also to pursue an active embodiment of it in our scholarship and in our living. It is in these ways that the past lives and that we can hold its complexity and, un and unfixedness. Kai Gangans, thank you. Thank you so much, Karim. That was fascinating. Um, we now have, we have about 30 minutes for, for questions and comments. I'm going to encourage you to put your questions in the chat and to direct them to Professor Tariq Jenkins, who, who is kindly co-moderating with me. So he will feed your questions to, 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 to the collective as they come in. Um, so I'm going to use my position as moderator, perhaps, Karin, to come in with the first question while people collect their minds and, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and frame, frame their questions. Um, and, and I guess what fascinates me, look, look, the question that you raise is, is you know, one that we grappled with very intensely in, in the Sarah Bartman historiography. Mm -hmm. It was a huge mm -hmm. black feminist debate of, of, of the early teens. Um, you, you know, and, and, and in a way, Sarah, Auntie Sarah was, was, was way more extreme because literally we have three words reported as coming from her mouth. Those mm -hmm. are the words of Baba coming in London in 1810. And that is the only, the only trace in all the archive mm -hmm. of something she's reported to have said. Mm -hmm. so, so to construct the history of somebody that is so absent, Mm. It, it, it's a big deal. And, mm. and of course, Badrun, Desiree mm. Lewis, like Paula, you know, all of us, we discuss this question intensely that, that is it actually possible to access the, the real Sierra Bartman? Um, you, you know, and the post colonial literary scholars came in and said, well, actually, there's never going to be a closure. This very search for a truth. Is a waste of time because because we 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 we're never going to find it in 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 view of this absence even if it were findable which of course if your post-colonial literary scholar is an argument on its own but even if it were findable we, we're not going to find it in terms of of of, of Sarah Bartman's history and so some people would resist closure you know myself wrote an entire PhD thesis entirely on the absences. Mm -hmm. um, 
chapters of only one which actually dealt with Sarah Bartman and the others dealt with the, the, the absences um, and, and, and other people then treating rather Sarah Bartman's history as a literary text. And, and, and we have that, that series of li literary texts rather than mm. historical works published on her. So, 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 so that is where we had that debate. I, I think in, in, in relation to Grandmother Kratoa, I think that, that you simply had just have a lot more to go on because at least there's the journal. You know, at least there's an odd in the, in the blanket here, a toothbrush there um, to be found. Um, and, and my solution to that was to say, well, it's not the only archive and to go into what I called Sarah Bartman's natural world. The, 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 and, and I guess this is the question that I want to introduce because I think it's a critical one for the Simon Coy Center to, to, to ponder what does it mean when you talk about decolonization? Um, obviously the written archive, the journals, is not our only source. And, and if we're approaching um, this question from the point of view of indigenous knowledge systems, then the answers are very simple. The ancestor has chosen to speak through her descendant, namely you. The knowledge is not gone. It's simply being transmitted through a different way of knowing. Um, what fascinates me is how you juggle those different ways of knowing, how, how you juggle the on the one hand, there's what I think of as the rules of the game, the rules of evidence, the how evidence is, because obviously what happens to historical studies if we all say, well, I'm writing what I'm writing because my grandma told me so in a dream. Um, it's perfectly legitimate in certain contexts, but there is also the job of communicating with the existing world of knowledge, with the existing academic world, and, and how do we juggle those two. Um, so I think what I'm wondering about or what I'm trying to get at is the concept of the N archives I think is incredibly valuable and it, and it gives us a history. But do we incorporate other ways of knowing? Do we depart from them completely? Do we juggle them in some kind? And if so, how would we how would we do that? Or, or do we straight up say, well, I'm going to tell an indigenous story from the point of view of an indigenous knowledge system. And if you people don't get it, that's your problem. Um, and, and hopefully you young people will, will come up with many interesting answers to, to, which, to which we're really looking forward to. But, but I would want to pose right here at the inaugural lectures, this is a problematic that we will be dealing with for many years to come. And, and I welcome you, Karim, to, to kick us off. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think it's absolutely true. Um, and, and for me, part of the, the problem that you point to is the fact that the, that the discipl disciplines of you know, history on the, on the, in the one hand has been in, enshrined in the university and it's been separated out from artistic practice on the other hand and it's been, you know, um, literary studies has been enshrined and separated out from history and so that there's a kind of a disciplinary formation that, um, that accepts or, or uh, deems certain things, to, uh, certain sources to be to be acceptable and other sources not to be acceptable. And I think it's that that hierarchy um, of knowledge that that is so embedded in a sense in the stru structurally in how universities organize knowledge um, that should be challenged on a fundament fundamental level. Because if you know if the historian has to learn to recite poetry and then to write poetry, then there's something else that happens as, as well. So I would, you know, I, I, I think it's, a, I think you're right in saying that one has to let these things talk to one another, but before you let them talk to one another, clear the table, you know, reorganize the, the silos, reorganize the disciplines, reorganize what we, under, what we think about as to say, this is, this is valid and this is not valid as, you know, the Audrey Lord, um, statement that you're never going to dismantle the master's house with the master's tools 
um, you know, so is a, a bit of a, also a bit of a chase night, but um, I think the potentiality of the work, I think that, that you are doing in the, um, in the coins on unit and, and through various pockets in, in, in the university is actually to really shift all of those, those silos and all of those separations and imagine a much more integrated and a much more lateral um, way that can be of, of knowing a way of thinking and a way of producing research that is not the kind of the, the direction of the neoliberal university that we see failing all over the world actually. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Corinne. That, that gets us off to an excellent start. Um, so I see we have a question from Gertrude. She says, wonderful. Are copies of the presentation available? I need to reread to, to, to really grasp the intensity of the paper. Uh, Jim, do you maybe want to speak to that? We had a brief discussion of publishing it or so maybe yes yes i'm sorry if i may pivot yeah um yes we we can publish that and um and this conversation of course on the, the video of this will also be accessible and um for people also to engage um in this lecture you know from wherever they are you know, in the, the questions and so on. And um, and I know with Yvette's um, work, if I may, um, Yvette, um, you know, the, your early work on uh, was Eva raped. And then um, I know that uh, uh, that Karin, you know, uh, uh, differed on that in, the, in that debate. Um, but um, so that that's also very interesting. So is there a place for speculative um, historical method, you know, as a, as a, as, 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 a, as a method of research um, to decolonize? And so it's long after that work of events um, that Karin is now taking this up as a direct descendant of, of Krotoa with a particular concept of an archive. So, um, and it's yet the an archive that probably speaks to the silences of the violences um, that we speculate. Um, and that was uh, sort of tentatively suggested in the form uh, Krotoa. So, um, uh, Karin, um, are you still very fixed on your um, position on, on speculative um, historical method on, on gender-based violence. Um, and, and I know this could be sensitive because of your direct link to Krotua, but um, what does one do with these silences when the silences themselves are so violent? And um, yeah, what do we do with them? I, I have no objection against um, speculative scholarly work. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's important. I think what my, my argument, I suppose, is is more that more suggests that while we do the speculation, and I, and I think um, you know, if it does, you know, work did do this, is to acknowledge the uncertainty, acknowledge the the unknowingness, and so on, um, and also to, I mean, and I think that that unknowing and those in those silences what I wanted to convey in a sense also today is that there's power in that. I think the way in which historiography is kind of conventionally dealt with silences is to say that, um, oh, it, it's imagined, you know, we have a relatively re reasonably full archive, and we, but we find these silences and we can't know all of these things, but okay, you know, we kind of do our best. And what I'm saying is actually those silences are are a game changer. They are, they are way, you know, they should really direct us elsewhere. And that there is a that there's potentiality to to recognize completely different ways of, of knowing that have existed for millennia that we embody in a day to day way that we don't have the, um, the separation between what we live and what we teach and what we write at the university, but that those that those things are actually all entangled. Um, and I think that you know, so for me, that the the point about silences is not to 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 say that there's any anything wrong with imagining into them, but that one also needs to recognize that they point us in an, in other places too, and that there's but there's a lot of 
power um, inherent in that. I think that is a that is an avenue for claiming agency for you know for wrestling the academy away from um, you know from the north the global north um, and from various ways in which like I said the university is set up. So it is more in the sense of what that what what it allows us to get to that I'm that I'm quite interested in maintaining for, for the archive to hold this space to you know to push against um, the, the, the kind of totalizing uh, <laughs> the totalizing tendencies of, of historio historiographical narrative as it, at least as, as it has been practiced conventionally. Uh, th th thank you, June, for, for, for bringing that up. Um, I wrote that, that, that article when I was still doing my PhD. I just about started two years into my PhD in 1996. Um, and, 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 and I guess I will belabor this point just simply because I think it draws us back to my, my questions around methodology because cause I will be quite honest. You, you know what? What? really bugged my mind at the time about you know what we today call interracial relationships although they might not have thought of it themselves in that way was was the historical imagination i tried to imagine myself into a situation as you know i'm an economic historian where a man is from a culture that thinks that baths are dirty and and are unhealthy sorry the things that baths are unhealthy and thinks that that washing every three months is sufficient versus a woman from a culture that had made wax berry soap for 6,000 years. And, and I really, my mind boggled to imagine a fraction. And then I started looking at other. But of course, that, that the last sentence was just something that could not be said in 1996. I, I could not write an article like that. I mean, it's bad enough the one I did write. But, but, but so, <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that was not something I could have said in print in 1996. And if I had, it would not have been published. But, but, but these are kind of the, the, the other archives that, that, that we draw on. Um, so, so, Karen, I'm going to spare you. I'm going to spare you having to respond to that comment. But, but I raise it simply because, you, you know, I don't think an article in 1996 is that important, but I do think the question of, well, how do we arrive at the stories that we arrive at? And, and how do we develop different forms of, of, of rules or methodologies? I think, like I said, I think that is one that's continually going to be coming back. So it's purely in that context that, that I wish to, 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 to comment. OK, we have more questions. We have one from Justin. Thanks for this fascinating. I want to ask about the anarchive. Would this be the same as an anti-archive as opposed to a non-archive? Karen, over to you. Yeah, um, <laughs> this is a tricky one sometimes. Um, the, the terminology of an archive, the an, I imagine it almost like a, um, you know, like oil and water, so that there's certain aspects of lived life and all the things that, you know, our interiority, subjectivity, our, you know, notions of how we experience times in different ways, our physicality, um, emotionality, it's, all those things are not, you know, there's always some process of sifting or translation or shaping that occurs for it to be come set down into archival document as we you know, as we imagine it, you know, the so many kilometers <laughs> of archival document in LIDA or whatever. Um, so there is something that is almost like for Skrik, you know, it's gonna it pulls back from the tech the, the technologies of 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 archive. Um, and I mean this is in a sense it's very obvious. It's I've always I always struggled with an archive. I would tear my hair out sometimes thinking, but this is so obvious on the one hand, you know, that we know the things that escape archive, but yet it feels like there hasn't been, we haven't, we haven't really understood what that, what that means. What, what, you know, what is the, where is that world? Where is this 
this vitality that lives, you know, just on the side or just outside, but can never actually be, be held in archive. And if that is the case, then why do we put so much, um, you know, trust in the in, in colonial archives? Why, why does it become our source? You know, why do we regard it as our primary source material? And so that an archive is really a way to say that there's you know, the way to address that that intan that intangible um, uh, cloud of stuff, <laughs> you know, that shadows and that actually exceeds and scatters and moves around around archive. And my particular um, my particular concern has been with colonial archives and how it has shaped knowledge formation, especially as concerns, um, you know. The, so-called pre-colonial archive uh, in, in the Western Cape is, and, and with Koi uh, histories. But it doesn't mean to say that I don't think there are other forms of archive that kind of draw on the one hand of established technologies and more on other kinds of embodied, um, you know, in, in embodied ways of knowing. So there have been um, spaces, I think, where the lines are perhaps not as, not as clear as they are in um, in relation to colonial archives and um, the an archive because I think there the, the, the tension is quite pronounced um, but it and, and that is that is in a sense the foundation of the argument but I think it would also be uh, disingenuous to, to imagine that you know any archive that it, that has a piece of paper in it suddenly becomes you know <laughs> um, the the wrong the wrong kind of archive that in fact they, they are all community you know community made archives they are communal ways and uh, commons archives that are being assembled that fulfill very important roles uh, and I, I i'm very much in favor of those but i think those ways of collecting of remembering of holding is done with a different relationship to notions of interiority and intersubjectivity than um, some some of the more conventional archives that I that I refer to here. I don't know if any of that made sense. That made perfect sense. Thank you, Karen. We 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 Karen, we have we have more 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 deep questions. Okay, this this is a long one from Rafael Flores. Um, Humbled to be here today in the stimulating intellectual space. Thank you very much for such a fascinating presentation. Um, for, for now, I was wondering how you saw non-academic ways of engaging with Katoa story in relation to your notion of the archive. Is it not primarily in these engagements with Katoa beyond the walls of academia, I by non-academic? that the creative work of thinking through silences and colonial biases occurs. It cannot be a coincidence that those not disciplined by the rules of conventional academic historiography and indeed the actual colonial archive that are able to think beyond its limits. What does that tell us about the primary actors exploring the an archive? No, oh, thank you very much for that question. Um, I completely, completely agree. And I, and my currently the the work that I'm doing is looking at uh, what I call I'm trying to collect um, and understand what it might mean to engage in archival practices. And I'm looking particularly at autistic practices that, um, in a sense, strive to move a little bit between the academy and you know the world in a, um, and arc and ruins that of, of, of history as as it as it exists in the world. But I think also um, what I completely uh, you know agree that there are spaces in which there's much freer engagement with notions of archive and much more in uh, much more embodied and archival practices occur. It would be a mistake to imagine that there are any spaces that have not been shaped in a sense by um, kind of Western epistemologies, and so these things are so, uh, you know, in the way in which the, the news is read out, in the way in which, um, you know, the codex of books are published, the way in which, you know, anything, um, anything, effectively occurs at the um, in the world that we live in has been touched in some way by Western ep epistemology. So there's no untouched land somewhere that we can go and say, oh, you know, here's this an archive living happily and free and we can, you know, we can imagine ourselves as though we're anthropologists going to study it. So I think the importance of, of you know, the, the, some of that structuring and some of that damage is done 
has been done through you know the academy through enlightenment ideas that have been disseminated across the globe and that in fact what is also needed is a is a robust and embodied pushback against it and that's what i think the 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 role of scholarship from the global south and, and in places like the koyan sang unit and the center for african studies that is where that work is happening that is where that pushback is happening and we do need scholarship for it um, we cannot imagine in a sense it just exists like i said some way but that that also needs to be brought into view to the academy we cannot let the academy just persist and just continue in its own um its own way especially if we if we consider the you know how does a, a, an institution like uct imagine its relationship to its community if it simply is is which i don't which i don't think it is but if if, if an institution simply reproducing structures from the global north in a space like cape town you know what is what is the what is the purpose of that so, so that so how do you get that push back into the academy and how do you get this wellspring of knowledge and being um and and on and and archival practices in a sense needs to to be put in conversation with the academy and so as to transform academy and so as to to build in sense of massification also of knowledge that that can be surfaced and circulated back into the world and to as my um my my supervisor here likes to say, it likes to say provincialize europe which I, I an idea i very much like opportunity while we're waiting for um yvette to come back in just a comment from professor leslie green uh, notes that you know the disciplines took form around the interests of the global expansion which is capital property and ownership knowledge became organized around extractable objects not relations as she quotes as colonization in thinkification much else if not everything else did not fit the narrowing of the empirical and this was rendered as culture and spirit entrenching a dualism in knowledges is it possible for us to imagine knowledges based on connection without the dualisms of matter, spirit, mind, body, land, soul, et cetera, and to recognize ancestral knowledge as the knowledge of relations, instead of rendering non-disciplinary integrative knowledges of ancestors as spirit, and therefore out of the realm of the empirical. So that's, that's a, a comment and a question for you, Karin. Yes, <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Um, I think that's you know that is I'm I'm trying to get at exactly that through um, through in, in in my own way um, possibly through through a way of um, you know, accounting for my own my own inner world and my own you know my own dualism that I'm that that I that sometimes I feel split in split off and i sometimes think about why how does that happen where does it happen what are these things and you know i was trained as an artist and i my, my i still see my work even though scholarly very much as from the position uh, position of an artist so i think what i'm possibly trying to to do is to kind of give voice to the to the structures and images in my in my head and through scholarly argument um as opposed to say an, analyzing something out there in the world but I think you, I think you're absolutely right in saying exactly what um, where I'm trying to what I'm trying to get at um, get at as well. And I think it's what your work, which I love, has done also is, is you know given shown various connection in in ways that shows the urgency also with which this this needs to happen because I think there's been a certain complacency, and um, it's the voice that we need right now. Um, so I'm very um, I'm very moved. Uh, by by your um also by your calls for, for, for rethinking this i think partly partly the worry that i have about my own work is that it's that it's um because it's so subjective uh it comes from such a subjective place that i don't always know how well people are able to connect <laughs> find connection to it or, or how well it is able to do work in the work in the world um and that is something i'm trying to trying to be better at um where I am now. But thank you, though. that's a lovely. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, this is such an important contribution that, that you're making and that this whole project is making. So it's just, it's, it's a wonderful provocation 
to think um, between the disciplines that are mm. just drilling down and down and down um, into you know holes that that it gets smaller and smaller and that the spaces between the disciplines get bigger and bigger instead of smaller and smaller and you know then we're vulnerable to those who do narrate the big picture which is the neoliberals um you know but i think one of the big questions i have in in working with environmental governance sciences is that um when we start to speak in the language of spirit our work gets marginalized um oh you know they're just off with the fairies <laughs> and um and so that becomes a trap um and so what i'm trying to think about is a way to think outside where i don't land up in that trap where we don't land up in that trap um but um but anyway i won't say any more now but thank you so much this is really a very wonderful um, talk much appreciated Thank you. That's 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 so very kind. I think the um, that I that I recognise what you're saying is, and uh, if I may just quickly respond as well, that um, it, it's it's but it is that that judgmentalism around you know that there's been there's a, this dualism has been set up between the, like the knowledge and spirit, and then anytime the spirit tries to come back, you know it's it's deemed oh no 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 we we don't want you here, um, and we still you know so that's why I think what what i would what i hope in a sense that an archive does as a as a constellation is to reorganize how these things fit together and that is something that can almost exist a priori before you know so we, we don't in a sense have to adopt the language the, the dualistic language which we can say this actually you know the way in which uh, archive and source speaks to the world is has been totally mis misconstructed and we rethink it and it's from this basis that we proceed and if that can happen i think hopefully we can we can start getting somewhere yeah, thank, thank you kevin and and um and I, I have to say leslie you're you're about to get me off on a totally deep end here but um may i suggest that it's possibly not so much about finding solutions is about creating an intellectual world in which more and more things are thinkable and, and more and more things are, 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 are sayable. Um, and, and, and I think it's an entirely human pastime. I, I mean, Leslie Green of all people will understand where, when I say that, that, you know, human beings were chopping trees and destroying forests and, 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 and inhibiting the earth's ability to breathe and next thing the forest center virus that, that inhibits humans ability to breathe so so, so you know spirit my, my point is spirit i think speaks anyway it, it doesn't really stop to ask if we if, if it's okay with us that it speaks um and, and and i think no more nowhere more than in 2021 does one grasp that um what i would want to suggest is the discussion we're having the notion of, of expanding our conceptual world is a process for us it's a process for human beings to to make sense of the world rather than rather than than, than an insist rather than in, insistence on honoring the spirit i think the spirit manages quite well um without us um that said tariq i must ask you to 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 please read the questions um i'm a historian i don't understand about technology but now everything that was in my chat box before i came back in the meeting is now gone so um, going to have to ask you please just to if there's any questions we missed no problem thank you but um here's here's a question from uh tyra storage of justice uh, member greg fick um for you uh, karin he says have you ever experienced the feeling that the silences we are trying to speak are speaking to you and that this and that it stirred you to dig deeper and um, he, he also iterated previously a comment about the importance of allowing um, uh, spiritual um, communications uh, in a way um, to be acknowledged within, you know, with, with, within the academic context. And perhaps if you could speak a little bit to that, um, um, but to repeat his question, you know, have you, have you experienced the feeling that these silences are, are trying to, to speak to you and have they stirred you uh, to dig deeper. 
Absolutely. I think that's the whole basis of every of everything I've done. And I, I always, um, I can't wrap my head around a lot. You know, if I, if I look back at, you know, the lot, you know <laughs> over my life, there's a lot that I can't make sense of. Um, and partly because it's not, you know, I, I have a very, very strong sense not of, of having chosen something, but having kind of been taken and said, okay, this is what you are doing. This is now, this is, the, yeah, yeah, off you go. This, that's your, <laughs> that's your task. I've been given work to do. And I feel that that's, and I'm very serious. Um, I take the work very seriously, but I don't, but it's not, I haven't, it's not something I elected to do that. So, you know, they were, various kinds of things on offer and I was like mm, that looks interesting I think I'll go for that at all um, and what when I called this talk when I, when I gave it the title following crypto into the archive I think that was something that comes exactly from the experience we you know you, as you and we, we understand this from archival research it's not uncommon to say that oh you find this thing and you say oh um, I'm going to find out more and I'm going to learn more. And the more you try to learn, the more it, it you know, it, 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 it escapes your, your grasp. But I think what became very apparent to me in this, in this process is exactly this not knowing that that moved me. So yes, I think it is, it is more, it's more the silences that moved me than the actual material. I mean, I did go painfully through the, from the Rebeek, uh, and sub, you know, the VOC, uh, registers and, and you know, but I, you know, I did that kind of like eating your, you know, your broccoli when you were a child, because I think that you, you had to kind of find out what there was. Um, but visually and conceptually and emotionally, those were never, that was never the space, although that was never the space that was meaning, meaningful to me. So I think you know, I have, like I said, a palpable sense, not of, not of having, not of having authorship of what I do, but having given the, the work, and the work has been to, the work has been indicated, the flashing indication of, you know, that that was the silences. I think that 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 had moved me. Then I don't. I, I hope that addresses that that question. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose last two questions. I have one for you, uh, Karen. Um, UNESCO, in its conventions, has uh, particular definitions of intangible and tangible. And we know that, uh, especially in the context of uh, communities, indigenous communities or First Nations communities around the world that have suffered ethnocide, genocide, and um, are, are you know, having to dig into these empty archives to, to, to formulate traces of history that would augment definitions of, of tangible and intangible heritage. Would you feel that the approach of of the archive, if, as you've described it, could possibly be a catalyst or a catalytic vehicle to help fill these voids that uh, indigenous communities have, and and how this particular interface around um, uh, indigenous knowledge systems and, and and academia, especially in as far as heritage recognition is concerned, through you know, processes of, 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 de of decoloniality. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, absolutely. I, I, I mean, that would be wonderful. But I think, you know, my, I, I have trouble with these overarching bodies like the UNESCO and so on and the, 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 the epistemological structures that they have in place. So there's always a sense of like, oh, yes, we have real knowledge, but yes, Okay, you can have your you can have your oral history. Yes, your yes, your oral history is very important. But anyway, we're going to get on with the real business now. So there's a there's a degree of um, almost you know uh, infantilization that occurs um, in some of these global structures that I that I'm very discomforted by. And I mean, one, one sees it in ways like in Australia and Canada. <laughs> you, see, you see it in very many kind of spaces where. The articulations of, of First Nations struggles are, um, or, or where First Nations struggles are being are, are being articulated and, and being pushed back against that. So yes, I mean, uh, I think some sort of re or some sort of intervention in into that 
globalizing, totalizing structure is definitely needed. Um, I hope that Dan Archive can help with that and I would love it to do that. Um, but I would have to give some thought of how that, to how exactly that would interface. But I think, um, again, it's about reorganizing, <laughs> reorganizing set notions of, of uh, you know, the metropole and the periphery. Uh, it just has to, has to happen in quite a radical way. Here's a question from um, Shamila Abrams, who says, women's scholarship can change the dynamic of the archive and social narration. Our voices are now unsilenced. What are the characteristics required of this level of scholarship in order to help restore adequate representation of humanity going forward? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think um, I think that's the work to be done in a way. Um, I don't. I'm I'm a little bit hesitant to agree that you know the voices have been unsilenced. I feel like there's quite a um, if it you know if it has been un, unsilenced, but it still it remains pocketed or it remains you know. Uh, delineated in a particular area, then I think that the, that we're in trouble. Um, so I, in a sense, would like to see much more pervasive reorganization, pervasive rethinking of knowledge production. Um, and I don't, re I mean, I, I, I'm looking at what people have done with what, where we are, but, I, but I'm hopeful that there could be quite a lot more, <laughs> quite a bit more radical, um, and inventive and you know some i imagine much more freedom and i don't really know what that looks like i'm trying to i'm looking out for for directions that that or for indications of where those are you know what directions exist or are prefigured in the now or where we might go but i i feel underqualified to answer answer that in an, in an authoritative way thank you karen and i think perhaps the the last question. Um, within the Koiko and San revivalist movements, and also being challenged through, you know, um, various uh, Vavudian tropes of ethno nationalism and essentialist thinking, in terms of your journey of, 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 of identity and grappling with the question of Africanness, um, how has, has, has this work linked to, to yourself, which is, uh, which is so. Uh, you know, deeply enshrined in terms of your your, your legacy, in terms of your family history, uh, you know, and 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 your relationship to to Africa, um, uh, ha, you know, has ha, has been. Um, could you um, you know maybe share some some insights around around that? Hmm. Yeah. Like I, like I said, I think for me it's been a, um, a you know any language one uses and that is is tricky terrain. I think any kind of phraseology one employs in relation to this. And so any anything I say, I think I do so advisedly. But since you asked me about my personal personal experience of it, I think um, I would I'll. Hmm. So hard to put into words. <laughs> it's in the anarchy, <laughs> it's not in language. Um, I don't, I feel that, again, that, that calling, I feel a sense of, of having been called not to, you know, not, not to do, um, not to inhabit a particular space, but to do work. And I think that's for me the, the important things. And I and I am very grateful for the for knowing the work that I that I need to do. And that I think is is the primary thing for me. I, I'm not uh, I, I don't um, particularly enjoy being on camera <laughs> and speaking and, and things like that. But I. I feel um, that this is part of the part of the, the work, and and um, you know, and I'm heavily reliant and, and indebted to story to, your, to yourself, the uh, Goring Icona, and, and you know, June and 
uh, these kinds of spaces for um, for hearing and listening and receiving also, but then to go also where I where I have to do the where I have space to to speak and to to, to speak in order to make the cha to make change there as well. So I, I'm sorry, I'm not very <laughs> I'm not very articulate on this on this issue. I don't know if you have anything more concrete that you would like me to say. Well, thank you very much, Karin. Um, thank you, Karin. Um, it, it was very informative and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll end the way I began by saying I'm, I'm so delighted and, and overjoyed to see the way a younger generation of scholars is, is taking the humble beginnings that we started with and taking it to places that, that, that we never even could have imagined. So, so, so thank you once again. Um, it, it's really been lovely. Um, Tony, I don't know if we could call on you maybe for one more poem, if we smile and ask you very nicely. Sure, of course. <laughs> thank you so much. Would you, would you please give us the pleasure of, of one last poem? Sure. So we closed the way we started. And I think I'm gonna ask all of us to just take a moment um, to just center ourselves, to really feel your feet on the floor where you are, um, to feel your spine straight, and to just take a moment and to thank all of our ancestors for making this, this circle and this gathering possible this afternoon. And that as I share these words, if we all just hold an intention of gratitude for Kratua, for her story, and for all the ways that it has come to light, and for what continues to teach us and offer us and open in us. I'll read two short poems to close. Kratua Eve's Roof 2, Repressed. I wanted to break the cage of bone and flesh smash it like wave on a rock until I could reach through to touch the other part of me where silence lives. I have come to fetch you, child. He is dead, but I see his face. I come to to hear my kids. I to hear your name. I have come to fetch you, child. He is dead, but I touch his hand. I have come to fetch you. Child, I am ready for tomorrow. My children, remember to place a stone on the can for its head. Kai Gangans, Kurukai. Thank you so very much, Tony. That, that was beautiful. And now I believe we call on Tariq to give thanks and to close. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Yvette. Um, and a huge thank you from the, the San and Koi unit, um, also from the Tara uh, Restorative Justice from a Center for African Studies. And um, on this extremely special occasion, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tony, for, for blessing us with your, with your incredible poetry and creativity. And, um, and on this uh, historic inaugural lecture of, of, of our, our matriarchal uh, figure of, for the Gorinai Kona, to have um, uh, uh, Chief Kratova's uh, ancestor speak to us is, 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 is absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Karin Zeman, for, for being with us today. Um, and, um, and for everyone, for, uh, for your listening, for your deep listening on the wind, um, and uh, thank you, uh, you know, to uh, Dr. June uh, Bam Hutchison, who has really, um, uh, you know, uh, placed this 
as a, 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 a very important annual event, which we hope will, will continue every year um, from, from, from now on. And so on, on, on behalf of, uh, from all of us, um, to, to say how great we are for, for, your, for your wonderful questions and engagement and, um, uh, and embodied listening. And, um, and we wish you a blessed uh, rest of the day. Um, and, and thank you so much. Um, Aisukure, cake and guns. Thank you, thank you, and yes, may you may the rest of your day huge, be wonderful. Yeah, and huge thank you to Yvette. Thank you, Yvette. I don't know if we covered you. I'm sure we did. Sorry. Thank you so much. We're very blessed. Thank you, everybody. You're so welcome. It was such a pleasure.